Uh, for everyone who's joining us, um, I'm talking to Lauren Dupree today, and she is an actor, writer, and self-love advocate. And if you haven't checked out her blog, Just Dupree, she's an incredible writer, and she writes about um, healing from eczema, topical steroid withdrawal, um, dealing with eating disorders, her journey as an actress, um, and there's just a lot of really incredible um, writing on her blog. And it's, even if you don't struggle with those things, it's really relatable because she does a really nice job of tapping into the emotional construct of those experiences. And um, Lauren, I just, I love your writing and I actually like have been taking notes on your blog and like have things. Oh I my write. gosh. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just like, it's beautiful. Um, so Thank I'm so you. excited Thank to you be, so much. yeah. And I'm really excited to be talking to you. Um, Lauren and I also went to high school together, fun fact. So we did. <laughs> graduating class of 07. Um, yeah. Whoop. <laughs> I know, I know. So um, I definitely want to talk to you about your healing journey and about journaling and about writing. Um, but first, I'd love for you to just give listeners a little bit um, of information about where you are, what you're doing right now, um, sort of what your focus is. I know things are crazy because of COVID, so that might have, oh, you know, yeah. that might be causing some shift. Um, but just give us a little rundown. Sure. Um, well, first, I do want to explain what topical steroid withdrawal is because I'm sure a lot of people are like, what? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, topical steroid, because I have eczema, I've used topical steroids to treat them my entire life. And um, when you use them for so long, your body basically gets addicted to the steroids and you keep needing stronger and stronger prescriptions and the eczema keeps getting worse and worse and worse to the point where it doesn't work anymore. So when you stop using them, your body goes through this horrible long process called topical steroid withdrawal where um, basically it takes like months to years for your body to level out just depending on the person, how long they've used the steroids, how long or how strong the steroids were. Um, so, um, yeah, I talk a lot about that on my blog just to raise awareness. And there's like a whole online community of people from all over the world going through the same thing. Um, as far as what I'm doing right now, um, I definitely, there's definitely more focus on the blog because like Rachel said, I'm an actor. Um, so my industry is like at a standstill <laughs> right now. Um, so that definitely um, put a lot of future plans on hold. I had one show that was canceled um, another one I haven't heard about, but I, I mean, I know it's going to be canceled, so we just haven't gotten the word yet. Um, and then an another one even more in the future where they're hopeful. Um, so we'll see. Um, I do theater if you haven't. Yeah. Um, so that has kind of been on hold, but, um, I write my own projects and produce my own content. And so, mm -hmm. so far that's um, mostly been like social media, YouTube, um, but lately I've been writing and working on um, larger projects like um, a short film and a pilot. Um, so in a weird way, having all this time, I'm like, okay, well, now I have time to like really focus on the projects that, you know, have kind of been put on the back burner. So that's been cool. Um, trying to think if there's anything else uh that sounds about right <laughs> yeah amazing and and are you still in Seattle I am yeah yeah okay. I was I was planning on moving probably to LA but when all this started I was like you know what I'm just gonna <laughs> I'm gonna stay still for a while and I'll if I move to LA it's not like I could get a job acting there so I was like I'll just stay in Seattle until things calm down right yeah right yeah, it's a pretty, I mean, like, this is a pretty crazy time. Um, and I think, yeah. uh, like, what you're saying, like, maybe it's a blessing that, you know, you have this time to focus on your personal projects. Um, right. And I know there's this, like, weird sort of balance of, like, okay, I have all this time now to focus on my personal projects, but also now there's all this pressure to focus on my personal projects because <laughs> right. I have this time, you know? And Yeah, um, yeah. I know a lot of people experience... Uh, really conflicting feelings about having all this time and feeling like, okay, now's the time for like my personal projects, personal developments, you know, growth. Uh, it's time for me to start journaling and meditating and all that pressure right. can actually make it, it can make it harder to actually start in introducing those things into our life. 
for sure. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, like when it comes to your self-written projects, what, what is like the, or I guess maybe with, you know, the one you're working on right now, what's the story that you're telling in sort of like a. Sure. Um, really it's my story. So just, hmm. so with the blog last year, I did like my first, I produced my first live show, which was kind of like, it was like a cabaret, but it had elements of like sketch comedy and like, you know, it, it had different elements within it, but I was talking about, you know, my health, my health journey and also um you know how that has been a struggle with being an actor and so after I did that I was like okay I want to do a short film and then I want to do like a series about you know um being an actor going through topical steroid withdrawal because I think that you know when people hear eczema they don't think it's a serious thing it's like oh, okay you get a little rash it's your skin but it's like no your skin is the largest organ of your body <laughs> and when it's all breaking out all the time like it's it's extreme and then it's also not just the skin it's um you know with top of steroid withdrawal you have like chronic fatigue you have adrenal issues mm -hmm. um insomnia anxiety depression like it all they're literally listed as symptoms on the um there's a website called um it's on it san dot org yes mm -hmm. um and it's kind of like it's a some doctors don't um recognize topical steroid withdrawal as a real thing and so it's on is kind of like a website raising awareness like um giving people who are going through it information about what to expect like having profiles on people who have gone through it or who are still going through it but yeah it's on on that website like anxiety and depression is listed as a symptom um so i think people just i including myself while i was going through it because at first i didn't even know i was going through it i was just like my body's freaking out and i don't know why mm -hmm. um but people just don't realize how one deb debilitating it can be and two just like how um emotionally taxing it is yeah yeah wow i think that's a pretty that's a a powerful story to share and i don't think it's a, a story that people hear about often yeah at all and yeah you know and i think you know i've read i've read a lot of, of your of your blog and the way you describe sort of just the the experience the emotional experience of a like having eczema and dealing with the physical outward appearance of it and mm -hmm. what that what that does to self-worth and self-confidence especially as an yeah. actor where where your face and your <laughs> your appearance is like such a big part right. of it and like yeah i just i just think about the amount of courage you have in a sharing that story but b like still saying like i'm going to show up and still do this work um and i mean you wrote i wrote something down is it okay if i read back something to you that you wrote oh sure <laughs> okay um it's in it's actually in uh your most recent uh blog post so lauren just wrote a blog post about um how topical and i always do this i say how tropical syrup <laughs> <laughs> even though it's topical I don't, know, I don't know what that's about but that makes it topical, sound more fun <laughs> i know right how topical steroid withdrawal prepared me for covid and it's like it's a great it's a great article just about how like dealing with anxiety and uncertainty has prepared you for the anxiety and uncertainty of what's happening but there's a part where you say uh the past five years of my life, I've been fighting for my health in a society that doesn't value healing. We glamorize healing, but the truth is healing is ugly. Healing is taking tiny steps every day, hoping you're heading in the right direction, but actually having no tangible proof that you are. Healing is faith. Healing is persistence. And that really struck me because I feel like I, you know, I am, I don't have eczema. I've, I've never been through topical steroid withdrawal. I've never taken topical steroids, but I have been on a healing journey. And, mm -hmm. and I imagine that a lot of people can really resonate with this idea of like, okay, I've made the choice to go on this healing journey, whether it's a physical healing journey, an emotional healing journey or, or a mental one and have that 
that experience of like people talk about healing like it's this like beautiful pathway to like a glorious end result where you're shiny and happy right. and pretty and it's right. fuck, it's not it's so it's not, not at that. all it's not at no. all no <laughs> no yeah that's funny because when i started my blog that's like what i had in my really i started the blog because i was healing from an eating disorder and then the topical steroid withdrawal stuff happened like, well, it, it happened before I started the blog, but the idea for the blog came from the eating disorder. And so I had this idea that I was like, oh yeah, you're gonna be like super fit and you're gonna like share all these cute recipes and workouts and you're gonna have a six pack and people are, people are gonna like wanna be you. And I was like, this is not, my life is not going like that right now. But I started the blog anyways and I was like, I guess, this is what the blog is about, like the mm -hmm. ugly truth. And so, and especially like with this topical steroid withdrawal journey, like I think recently that really, what I wrote is like so true to me now because I see how far I've come. But when you're in the middle of like, and I'm still in the middle of the healing journey, but like when you're in the thick of it, it's like sometimes it feels like there's no end in sight. And it's like, yeah. you just have to keep going and trust that you're heading in the right direction. And you really, really, really have to like praise yourself or pr just praise the process for like the little, the, the little victories that you see, because that's yeah. what's going to keep you going the entire time. If you keep looking at how far you have to go, but never look back at where you've come from, you're just going to give up because it's going to yeah. look impossible. But it's like, just, just rem reminding yourself like, oh, look, I used to be, I used to be there. And now I'm here. I want to be here, mm -hmm. but yeah. I've already gotten this far. So let me just keep going. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, forgive me, cause I don't know a lot about, you know, topical steroid withdrawal, but you know, I, I know that in, in my experience of healing from an eating disorder, it's clear in my mind of like, okay, uh, I know that if I'm using food to cope or I'm trying to control the shape or size of my body, or if I'm isolating, those are signs that I'm maybe not using these skills. So when I use these skills, I can say, I can make that little moment of I'm doing this one thing and I'm doing, you know, that's like the little praise moment, right? So mm -hmm. when it comes to top, topical steroid withdrawal, what are the, what are those moments where you can give yourself that? What are those action items or action things that you do where you're saying, okay, I'm moving through this in this moment, I've done this little thing. Sure. Um, well, I think lately for me, the, the, the thing about topical steroid withdrawal, like I said, like not everyone recognizes it as a real thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes it's difficult to find, it's not like I can just go to the doctor and they have a protocol and they're like, okay, do this, this, and this, and you'll be on your way to healing. Like, it's kind of like finding the right doctor, figuring out which method like which method I want to go to for healing because so many people do so many different things and it works like different things work for different people but I think a big part of it is really just figuring out what is it that I need to thrive and to heal and so it's really being in tune with your body and trusting your instinct um because I've seen I've spent so much money on like different types of naturopaths and acupuncture and just so many different things um yeah but I, I would say one, a big part of my healing process is changing my diet and again, figuring out exactly what it is that I need. But um, I would say one of those things for me is um, recognizing like, oh, I don't reach for those foods that I know aren't necessarily the most healthy for me anymore. Like it was hard to make that change at first, but now mm -hmm. because I've been doing it for so long, I don't even have to think about it. It's not something that's a struggle for me. Um, another thing is like, I like over the summer, um, getting up in the morning was like, just getting up out of bed at all just felt impossible. I was just so tired all the time, no matter how much I slept. Um, and now I like wake up and I can actually get up <laughs> like it's I when I recognized that I don't know like a few months ago I was like oh my gosh like I can I have energy again it's not like and it's weird because when you're going through it you don't realize a, a big thing that I struggled with was just like okay you slept enough like why can't you get up just do it just do it like you're being lazy or this that and the other and I, I really had to work on negative self-talk that's another thing that I think has 
another marker for me is um, my self-talk is so much more kind and positive and accepting of wherever I am. Um, I think like when I've gone to topical steroid withdrawal twice. So when I started again in April, um, I was, I had just done like three shows back to back. I had produced my show. I had just done a reading um, and I like filmed a, a commercial. So I was like, I was going, 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 but then I started yeah. talking steroid, steroid withdrawal again and it really just like knocked me on my ass. <laughs> and it was like, and I had no energy to do anything. So it was really hard to adjust because I was in this like forward motion and all of a sudden I didn't have the energy to do it anymore. So I think learning yeah. to accept that and, and like just accept this is where I am. This is what I'm capable of right now. And that's okay. That was a big thing for me. Yeah. Right. So it's the, it's more of the meta experience of accepting, accepting the ebb and flow of the withdrawal and having positive self-talk and encouragement rather than beating yourself up or saying, why is, why am I not better now or faster? Right. Or, right. Yeah. And especially going through it again. Cause so I went through topical steroid withdrawal and then I, I went back on steroids, but it was a different it was like a lower dose and it was a, it was a method that what I was supposed to be able to wean off of, but it didn't work. So when I started topical steroid withdrawal again, I was like, well, it shouldn't take that long because I wasn't on like full dosage and I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> so I, I had this idea. Yeah. I had this idea that like, it was going to be, I was like, well, I've been through it before. Like it'll be okay. Um, and I mean, it was okay, but it was, pro it was worse than the first time I think. Right. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. just for, for listeners who maybe don't have a full understanding of like the cycle of experiencing eczema to the point where you need steroids, what mm -hmm. can you walk us through sort of like that trajectory and, and the decision you ultimately made to take the steroids in the first place and then again a second time? Sure. Um, well, I never made the decision to take the steroids mm -hmm. in the first place. I've, I've had eczema since I was a baby. And that is just, that is what doctors prescribe for eczema. You have eczema, you get steroids. That's just how it is. And so for okay. me, I like, I don't really remember a life without it. Um, and as I got older, um, really when I was younger, like I had a few bad flare-ups, but for the most part, it was like manageable. Um, it didn't, it wasn't like people saw me and they were like, oh, she has eczema. It was just like something that I dealt with. And that came up sometimes. Um, I like one of the worst flares. We visited um, family in Arkansas, and I maybe because of the humidity, I don't know. Like my whole face broke out, so I spent like a year, my face like very splotchy. And the doctor told me to use Aquaphor, which is like super greasy. So I just looked like a grease ball exactly. for a year. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Basically. Um, but that's like one of the worst. That's one of the worst flare-ups I remember having as a kid. Mm -hmm. As I got older. Um, I remember getting flare-ups like on my face. Like I kind of always had it on my hands and I think like the insides of my elbow. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, but I remember like in college I would get these and it didn't even really look like eczema. It was just like my face would get dry and I'd be like, oh, okay, I'm like flaring up and then it would like calm down. But it, my, fa my face would just get dry. I don't think it was like... I noticed it, I don't think it was that visible to other people. Yeah. Um, but then I started getting, I got like a light patch um, right above, I don't remember which eyebrow, but just a patch um, above one of my eyebrows. And again, I just kept getting like stronger and stronger prescriptions. I kept, I had to like stay on the steroids to keep it like under control. Um, and then, who I'm trying to remember. Um, when I graduated, this is when I re when it really, really got bad. I graduated and I didn't have access to the doctor from school anymore. And I ran out of my steroids and I was like, okay, whatever, I'll be fine. Like my body just started freaking out. And so that was like the first sign of topical steroid withdrawal, but I didn't know what was happening. And so I went to the doctor. Um, I was like, what, why is this happening? She didn't give me a reason, but she gave me steroids. Oh, and so oh it was God. basically, yeah, yeah. So it was just this cycle of continuing to use steroids. And really with steroids, like you're only supposed to use it for like a few weeks and then stop. But I feel like I was constantly using it. And I remember right before when I decided to stop using them, it was 2014. 
And I started getting these like full, like my face would flare up. My, it, I would get like flaky all over my face. My eyes would swell up um, above my lips would get like cracked and raw. And I just got, and I was on the steroids and I would just get these flare ups that felt like they were coming out of nowhere. They were, um, I would always get them like when I had an audition, maybe it was the anxiety of having an audition. I don't know. Cause stress is a big factor too, but it yeah. kept happening. And I was using the steroids. I was using like a tube of steroids just for like my hands and the insides of my elbows in like a few weeks, I would use the whole thing and then just get another prescription. And so I was like, this isn't even working. <laughs> like I'm having these horrible flare ups and yeah. I'm using the medication like what's the point point? and so just I don't know something in me I especially like going to that dermatologist and her not giving an answer to the root cause I was like I just yeah. need to figure this out on my on my own so I just started doing online research and like I just threw the steroids out and the rest is history I guess they say wow, <laughs> yeah. wow. so that was so that was like 2014 when you first said I'm not going to take this anymore or I'm not going to yeah. use this anymore yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's all topical, right? There's no oral Well, some medication. people, some people get steroid shots. I actually did have a prescription for like these steroid pills. And I remember the doctor gave them to me and something just felt wrong about them. And I remember it got, when it got, when it was getting really bad, I remember looking at the like pills being like, am I going to take this? And cause the doctor gave it to me, it was like, just in case, you know, and I just yeah. couldn't bring myself to actually take it. Wow. Um, so I, yeah, I've only used topical steroids, but yeah, some people get steroid shots for eczema or, um, the, yeah, they take those pills. Okay. Yeah. So two, so 2014, <clears throat> you start going through withdrawal I, and mm -hmm. you said that you, you actually started your blog to talk about your eating disorder recovery and right. what, when did that start the, when did you start the blog? Uh, 2015. Okay. So, that so the idea, next year. Yeah, the idea for the blog came from the eating disorder, but, um, okay. and I did, I, I talked about it like in the beginning, but I think topical steroid withdrawal just kind of took over my life. So sure. <laughs> that became yeah. the focus. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and how did, how did the either, you know, how did, how did eczema and topical steroid withdrawal and the symptoms that have, that you had from that, whether, you know, depression, anxiety, the adrenal fatigue and the eating disorder, how did they all kind of integrate with one another or, re or react to or interact with one another? Sure. Um, well, I think with the eating disorder, it was, yeah, with the eating disorder, I was like, before the top of the syrup withdrawal started, I was already, I had already um, cut out uh, what did I, dairy and gluten from my diet because I noticed that it had an effect on my eczema. And so I was already trying to figure out like the healthiest, the healthiest diet for me or the, the best, you know, um, yeah. what's the word I'm trying to, yeah, just the best lifestyle, I guess, for me. And I was trying to find a way to stick to it because I, I, um, I had an issue with like binging. And so mm -hmm. I was trying to figure that out. But I think once the topical steroid withdrawal started, the focus was just like, what healing diet can I go on? And so I think that was, it was difficult because a lot of those diets are very restrictive. Um, but I think that I was like so desperate for healing that it made it easier to stick to those diets. But I think being at this time I was living in DC and the hard thing was like maintaining some sort of normalcy in my life because you know people like when you meet with friends or meet new people it's always like let's go out for drinks or let's go out to eat and doing those extreme diets kind of took that aspect of my life away because it was like mm -hmm. well I can't I can't drink alcohol right now and I don't know how they're cooking this food in this restaurant so I can't eat this mm -hmm. um so that was an interesting um transition I guess as far as like the depression and anxiety, um, that was that was something that was present before topical steroid withdrawal, but topical steroid withdrawal amplified it. Um, and I think especially with the eating disorder, like that was a very dark time for me. And honestly, with the eating disorder, that was the first time that I experienced topical steroid withdrawal symptoms, but I didn't know. 
because that's when I was asking the doctor, what can I do? And she was like, here, yeah. take these steroids. And so I thought that I started to get better because of the changes that I made in my diet, which I'm sure mm-hmm. helped, but a big part of it was that I went back on steroids. Um, right. but, um, but yeah, the topical steroid withdrawal really amplified the anxiety and the depression just because I was in, a, I was in the middle of a show when all of this started too. So I was like, I, I remember suppressing like panic attacks on stage because I just felt like everything was completely out of my control and I didn't understand what was going on with my body. I didn't know what to do. Um, and I was worried about the future because I was like, I'm out here trying to be an actor. I want to move to New York and my face is like falling off. So it was really, yeah. I mean, it was, it was all very connected. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I mean, first of all, I just like, I, my audience knows I, about my history with an eating disorder and depression and anxiety. I talk about it a lot, but I just had this moment of thinking like how fucking cool it is that we can talk candidly about this stuff. Because I remember in high school when I first, when I, when my eating disorder was born thinking, I'm never going to be able to talk to anyone about this because it was yeah. so taboo. It was so taboo to even yeah. say that word eating disorder. And it's still a yeah. little bit like, you know, the words, you know, binge eating or bulimia or purging, those words can be, they feel like they don't have a space in public right. conversation. And right. um, I just, I, I appreciate your, um, your honesty and your, your transparency and vulnerability, because it's, um, it's a topic that I think uh, it still needs to have awareness brought around it. And definitely, and I just, I think it's uh, incredible that there's, there's space for us to be candid about it um, online. So thanks for joining me in that space. Um, yes. But I also, I'm just, I was, when you said I was holding back a panic attack on stage, I just like felt like a lump in my throat of the, the, the helplessness that you must have felt. And like mm-hmm. that, the feeling of like being so out of control of your body and your feelings and just not having answers right like yeah having have like being in like being in pain or suffering and not having answers as to why or to how to you know or to a solution is one of the most painful experiences yeah and it was it's very isolating um yeah like yeah I just remember like people trying to give me advice or like like I was in a relationship at the time and um we broke up because we needed to, but I like, I broke it off. And like, I remember my dad being like, oh, your skin's going to clear up now. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and like people telling me like, you know, oh, well it's, it's in your, maybe it's in your mind. And I'm like, this is not, this is not in my mind. It's not that I'm not being positive. Something is wrong. <laughs> like something yeah. is wrong. And yeah. I just felt, yeah, I felt like it was, it was belittled. Um, that I, that's something that I've dealt with this entire time, which is probably why I'm so, um, vocal about Mm -hmm. what this experience is like, because people just really, they don't get it. They don't. Yeah. And and it's, yeah. And it's really, it can feel super invalidating to have someone say like, it's, it's probably in your head or you're probably just stressed out or it's not as, it's not as bad as you think it is or, right um you know just why don't you just take the steroids or do what your doctor says like or you know like it's just uh, and I think that there's not a lot of education around how to hold space for people Mm -hmm. and we're you know we live in a society that really values fixing um fixing and solving over understanding and empathizing and right um I'm hopeful that those those cogs will start to shift for people as yeah as these conversations happen um, around mental health and around holding space for people and um, it's it's not uh, intuitive um, in our society. No, and I think I going through this. I think I've just gained so much understanding and empathy for like what other people are going through because I think I. I just didn't get it. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but now I, I like make a conscious effort to like, like you said, to hold space for understanding and instead of like, well, let's fix it or let's do this. And like, mm-hmm. sometimes people just need an ear. 
<laughs> they just need someone to listen. They don't need you to give your opinion or your solutions. Um, and I also make it a point to like, if I'm having conversation with someone like, what do you, do you need an ear? Do you want a solution? Like, what is it that you need right now? Like, do you have the capacity for this at the moment? Um, because every, everyone's going through something and it's just about, yeah, like making space for people to be themselves and have their process. Yeah, no, yeah. I think that's, that's a huge, that's like a really great piece of, um, wisdom to say, you know, when I sit down in a conversation with someone, how, how can I support you in this conversation? It's, you know, do you tell me what you need? Um, right. rather than, rather than assuming, cause we all need something different. Some people actually right. want ad advice. Some people want, they're like, tell me what to do, you know, and other, right. people, other people like me and you, like sometimes just want someone to listen and say, right. I'm here, I'm here. And Right. So, so, you know, showing up and saying like, how can I support you and what do you need? Um, and also knowing that sometimes people don't know what they need. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we just, we try little things and hope for feedback. Um, right. But this also got me thinking about how I imagine that you, you had to do a lot of self-healing um, for, yeah. for the thoughts, for the emotions, for the times when you were invalidated or belittled or, or when your experience was minimized. And, um, and I know that you do a lot of journaling and I know that, you know, writing is a very cathartic experience too. And I actually saw, um, I saw on your blog that you wrote a letter to yourself, which mm -hmm. I, it's like such a great journaling practice. Um, my, my journaling group knows about this, but for, for people that are listening, um, writing a letter to yourself is one of the most healing ways to, um, provide yourself with wisdom, parenting, love, compassion, um, and tap into an inner knowing that maybe is hard to tap into on a day-to-day -day basis. And a lot of letter writing can be writing to future self, writing to past self. Um, and Lauren wrote this really beautiful letter to her, um, I guess you could say inner child or past self or yeah. younger self. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and I, can I read it? Can I read something to you again? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> it was sure. such a it was such a great letter because, um, well, I'll just read. So I wrote, I wrote a couple things down that you, that you wrote in this letter to yourself that really struck me. Um, uh, let's see this one. Okay. So you wrote, I want to warn you that you're going to experience seasons of doubt, insecurity, and shame. I wish I could say you could skip them, but they're only going to make you stronger. That really struck me because I think a lot of times as adults, when we're in pain, our instinct is to tell ourselves, like, I'm going to make sure this never happens again. Mm -hmm. I don't want to feel this way. So I'm going to find ways to stop it from happening again. Mm -hmm. And this, this statement that you made to your younger self is, is actually so wise because you're offering both your past self and your present self and your future self, the wisdom of. I can't stop the suffering. I can't prevent the pain, but it will right. make you, I might tear up. <laughs> oh, then I might but, tear up. <laughs> but it will make you stronger. And yeah. like, I think that's such a compassionate statement because it creates space and room for you to be human and for, for life to happen and to know yeah. that when it does, you will be able to handle it. So I just, I thought that was really wonderful. And I, um, I, I, I just, I wanted to know, like, I wanted to know what that experience was like for you writing that letter to yourself and if you've read it again and. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I actually, um, for women who roar, I don't know if you know of them, they're like a online platform and I saw they they had like a call for writers on Instagram and I saw that and I was like late for the deadline but I was like I want to do this anyways because I love I love this prompt um <clears throat> and it was actually when I started writing it it kind of just all 
came out, it wasn't really what I was expecting to write, but it just came out like effortlessly in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um, But as far as that specific, um, what you just read, I think that, especially with this journey that I've been on, I like, when I started this in 2014, I thought I was gonna be done by now. (laughs) Like I thought I was gonna be like back in New York and like, you know, trying to be on Broadway or something. Um, And so I think just really accepting like things don't always go as planned and it's going to be difficult, but it's not always, uh, the result doesn't always have to be negative, I guess, because I think I've learned so much on this journey. And I've also, I've opened up, like I used to be so, what's the word I want to use? Just so closed off and so like protective of my emotions and, and who I was and being afraid of being judged by other people. And I think going through something that you have no control over that that dramatically alters the way that you look and the way that you move through the world. It's like, I don't have time to be ashamed (laughs) of who I am. Like, I do not have the time. Like, this is who I am. This is what I'm going through. And you're going to take it or you're going to not. But at the end of the day, I'll be okay. And that, that is not the person that I've always been. So I think that that's, I think that's why I wrote that specific chunk that you read because it's like all of these things that feel like they're the end of the world they're actually just going to make you stronger and more yourself and they're going to help you move through the world in a more um in an unapologetic way yeah so yeah yeah oh I I just have to say that out loud again to make sure people hear it I don't have time to be ashamed (laughs) I mean like can I get can I get a poster? Can I get that right. printed? Like, live, live, laugh, love is out. I don't have time to be ashamed. Is in. Like, it's the new pink. It's the new black. Right. I want it. Right. It's. I love it. I love it. Um, and uh, you also wrote something that sort of like reminds me of that. You said people will try and tell you you need to be one thing or the other, but you are all the things. <laughs> I loved that too, because again, it's this sort of acceptance of just, you are as you are in all of your ways, in all of your parts. And there's nothing that you have to, to hide or keep secret or, or, uh, hold back from or pretend or, or be ashamed of you are all the things and they are all you, you know? Um, so I love, I loved that. And I, um, and I think it's a great journaling exercise um, for people to try. And yeah, I just thought, I thought it was really, it was, it made, it made me want to write another letter to myself and go back and read ones I've written. Um, right. So I'd love to know what are some other journaling practices that you use? Sure. Um, well, journaling has been like, a constant in my life I mean I think there are definitely times when I've stopped and come back but like I've been journaling since I was in elementary school and I still have those journals which is hilarious but um um, I I don't yeah (laughs) oh oh boy (laughs) oh yeah yeah it's great um but I, I will say like when I sit down and journal I usually don't like sit down with, okay, I'm going to do this today, or I'm going to do that today. It's kind of just however I feel is how it comes out. So sometimes Mm -hmm. that's like in the form of poetry. Um, I used to, I used to do that a lot. Um, I would say that's not something that I do much anymore, but, um, that was a big journaling practice for me, uh, when I was younger. Um, but like sometimes it comes in the form of like kind of just like stream of consciousness writing just like whatever just like throwing up on the page (laughs) um and and sometimes it's more like i think the biggest thing that i do is when i sit down to journal it's usually because i'm trying to work out some sort of like emotional state that's that's just like, I can't, why, why am I feeling like this or what's going on? Um, and so a lot of my journal, a lot of my journal entries turn into like prayers or, um, really just like, uh, what's the word 
really just like getting down to the nitty gritty of like the root of like whatever negative emotion I'm feeling or like whatever fear I'm dealing with at the moment. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. So it's sort of like a, a brain dump that sometimes shows up in the form of poetry, sometimes shows up in the form of just like word vomit, sometimes yeah. it shows up in prayer or, yeah. um, and uh, I think that's, that's actually something I've been practicing lately because it's something I haven't done in a long time, but it's also what I used to do when I was little. I would just sit down and just let it out. And sometimes it would come out as poetry, sometimes it would be a doodle, sometimes I would write dialogue, like a screenplay that would kind of oh, play cool. out. I mean, yeah, there's some other weird <laughs> shit that happened in my journals, but um, I actually have them all with me. I might pull them out later and have a gander, but um, <laughs> but lately I've been I've been returning to the this sort of brain dump idea, and mm -hmm. um, it's been really helpful actually um, to start my day that way. And yeah. Um, you know, I also do like the sort of more structured pieces of like having gratitude, uh, affirmations, manifestation mm -hmm. statements and something that's more structured. Um, but it's nice to kind of have like some ebb and flow and like allow for different things to happen based on where you're at. Um, right. And a lot, you know, a lot of people, like one of the biggest questions I get about journaling is like, how do I stick to it? How do I make it a routine? How do I carve time out for myself like I just you know I say I want to do it and then the day goes by and I just I'm, I'm, I'm I resist it or I just don't do it right. um yeah can you talk about how you keep it a practice sure I mean I think I'm definitely not perfect <laughs> I think that there have been like huge chunks of my life where I like just have not journaled and and now looking back I I know like that's probably why whatever I was going through maybe took longer <laughs> to get through because I wasn't like journaling. Um, but I think for me, like, yeah, even since I was in elementary school, I remember like whenever I journal, like getting a new journal is like super exciting for me because it's like, oh, I want something that's like gonna make me excited to write in it. And also I, I used to have, like, I remember I used to have like a pen with like feathers coming out of it. So every time I sat down, I was like, okay, it's time to journal. <laughs> so now I don't have like a fancy pen, but I do have a pen that's like dedicated to the journal. Cause it's like, it's something about like the feel of it and the way that it writes, it's like familiar. And it's like, this is like a ritual for me. So I think mm -hmm. that that's a big thing for me. I also like at one point in time, I would just carry my journal with me everywhere I went. And any time that I like felt the urge to write, I was like, okay, let me, let me get my journal and just jot mm -hmm. this down real quick. And I think like when you have it with you, you can't forget about it. It's just like always in your face. Like every time you go in your bag, it's like, oh yeah, my journal. So I right. think like putting it in places where you can't miss it. Like if you have it tucked away in a drawer or like, you know, on a shelf with a whole bunch of other stuff, you may not see it, but if it's out in the open, it's like a constant reminder. Um, and also I think like I, I started your, um, your journal challenge. So I think I did the first four days I need to come back to, and then I kind of deviated and did my own thing, <laughs> but I'm going to come back. But, um, but I, I did that. And then I also did a, um, a like writing workshop on Instagram live that that's one cool thing about now like all these free resources happening online but yeah. um she she offered some like um they're really like writing exercises not necessarily journaling but I did it in my journal and it felt like <laughs> it felt like yeah. journal practices um but one of one of the exercises you did that I loved was the um draw yourself as as if draw yourself as if you were your own child looking at yourself. Did I mess that up? That's right. Okay. No, that great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, but I, I love that exercise because one, I, I used to like doodle and draw, like I have like old sketchbooks, but I just have not, that's not a part of myself that I've exercised for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And so to do that at first, I was like, this is like weird. I was like nervous. <laughs> Cause I was like, what am I going to do? <laughs> and then I just started, I like, was trying to make it like one thing, but then as I kept going, it turned into what it needed to be. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like it was one, it was, it was nice to exercise that part of me again, 
but two, it was also nice to just like release control and, and follow the prompt and just trust that whatever it was, was going to be right. Um, mm -hmm. So I may, you know, add in some, some more drawing into my journal now. <laughs> so that was cool. I think, I think that, I think if you're feeling like in a rut or uninspired to journal, <clears throat> I think like following prompts or finding new ways to like engage yourself um, is a great way to get back into it. Cause yeah. starting your challenge kind of like inspired me to like journal more often. So, yeah. I think that's like really good advice is like switching things up and, and knowing that there isn't one way to journal or a right way to right. journal, like any, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, is fine and whatever you're doing in your journal is is great and the the point is like are you sitting down and connecting with yourself in some way using a pen and paper right. and so it can be through through prompts that that you just like let go to and release to or it can be like letting out what's in your head or it can be using drawing and imagery or it can be a writing exercise um poetry writing there's no right way at all um, right. And so I, I love that reflection. I think that's really valuable. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Lauren, I'm like, I'm so glad that we got to connect. Um, Me too. And, and that you took the time to, uh, to share yourself with us this morning. Um, it's been, it's been really nice to talk to you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. This was, this was really cool. My sure. and I, pleasure. I really love what you are doing as well. And I think like you, like you said, like talking about eating disorders or like anxiety, all this stuff, it was like, at one point it was very taboo. Maybe it still is a little bit, but I love that you are making the space for it and making the space for other people to talk about it as well. So thank you. Thank you. And um, before I let you go, can you just let listeners know um, how they can find you online if they want to, you know, check out your blog or your Instagram or your, um, I know you do some performances that they can go watch. So. Sure. Um, so for the blog, it's um, justdupree.com. That's J-U-S-T-D-U-P-R-E. -E. Um, and my Instagram handle is Just Dupree, the blog. Um, so <laughs> that's how you can keep up with like whatever I'm posting or going through at the moment um and then if you're interested in um like performances you can find me if you just look up lauren dupree on youtube you can find me um it's there's a space in my last name so it's d-u space p-r-e-e -E. or you can uh follow i have two instagram pages the other one is more dedicated to like performance um so that's just d-u underscore p-r-e-e -E. Amazing. And I'll make sure to type that up too and put it in the group so that people can click links easily. Um, cool. Before we go, I've been forgetting to do this. So I'm going to make sure I do it. I'm All right. Do a boomerang for the gram because oh, a boomerang. I know, I know. <laughs> I feel like such a millennial when I try and do boomerangs. We'll see if I can. Nope. You know, oh. it's like. <laughs> that okay, was just immediately like, no. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it. I gotta find the filter. Oh yeah, it's very important. All right. Okay. okay. On the count of three. Okay. One, two, <laughs> three. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lauren. I really appreciate you you being here, and we'll talk soon. For sure. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.